Boom. Welcome back to another episode of the Growth Driven Agency Podcast. Here I am, fearless leader, Joey Gilkey. And we're going to jump into... I have an awesome conversation today with an amazing guest. We've got my friend Mel Carson from Delightful Communications, who's going to bring some of the heat, talk about his journey, talk, talk about his agency, he might get into a little personal branding action. But Mel, why don't you give the people what they really want? Who are you? Where are you from? Tell us about your business a little bit, and then we'll dive into some questions. Very good. Good morning, Joey, and good morning, everybody. My name is Mel Carson, and I'm the founder and CEO of Delightful Communications. We are a B2B technology marketing agency based out of Seattle. Um, I'm, as you can tell from my accent, from the UK. I moved to America almost 10 years ago uh, and was working for Microsoft for many years before leaving in 2012, starting Delightful, uh, getting married, having two kids, and um, generally living the American dream. We're a, a B2B technology marketing agency that does two things. One is integrated marketing for brands. We work with people like Microsoft and Intel and uh, Accenture and other folks like that. And on the other side of the business, we have a growing um, practice around executive communication. So things like leadership and personal branding for executives um, right across the world. Love it. I love it. Yeah. Thank you for being on, man. Um, you got a kind of a cool story. I know you, you talked uh, prior to a little bit. So you worked at Microsoft at yep. one point. You were fired or let go from Microsoft, and then they hired you in an outsourced capacity right after. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was at Microsoft for seven years. Um, okay. Started in 2005 to launch Ad Center, which is now Bing Ads. And that was a crazy journey. Fantastic experience. Amazing people, amazing company. And, uh, I kind of graduated into, after a couple of years, just when social media really started taking off, you know, when we think of Twitter and Facebook and things like that, mm. graduated into a community management role where I was part of the digital marketing industry, but kind of the face of Microsoft there, writing a lot of blog posts, speaking a lot of conferences, uh, engaging and supporting people on social media. Mm. Um, and as I said in my intro, moved to uh, Seattle with Microsoft. And then a year later, uh, I got laid off with 5,000 other people. It wasn't anything personal. It wasn't anything I did. It was just a, a restructuring um, that the company wanted to do. But it was the only second time in their history that they'd ever laid anybody off. Um, wow. I wrote a blog post about it, just being you know, very vanilla, just, you know, I didn't want to burn any bridges, but just letting people know that this had happened and I was for hire, and it went viral. Um, <laughs> it got picked up by the business press and, you know, by a lot of industry press and got shared a lot and whatnot. Phones started ringing off the hook. Um, Google, Facebook, Yahoo, a bunch of agencies wanted to hire me. Mm. But I thought, you know what? I got a couple of months, couple of months severance pay. What can I do with this? Um, maybe there's an opportunity here to try and do something um, for myself uh, and for my family uh, and ultimately for other people because, you know, I've got certain opinions about how agencies should be built and what they should do and how they should service their clients. And so the concept of Delightful Communications was born and two months later we launched. Wow. So somewhat of a blessing in disguise. Yeah, totally. totally. How would you view that at the time? I'm just curious on your on your mindset and and how you're kind of processing all of this at the time. Obviously, it sounds like you're part of something really cool. Um, obviously, being a part of launching what would then become Bing, and, uh, you know that that had to be kind of a a unique opportunity for you. And then for it to go away after you moved your whole life to Seattle, how are you processing all this at the time? Obviously, you can look back hindsight twenty twenty. It's like yeah, that shit's dope. I now have delightful communication because of what happened, but at the time, was it pretty tough or was it just part of the journey for you? Um, it, 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 was, it was a little bit annoying. <laughs> you know, it was very English of me, so it's a bit annoying. But um, I, I'd read the tea leaves. I could see it was coming. Um, uh, 
j- just because you know there were always rumors and yeah. things were filtered down and i looked at everybody on our on our team and thought well the most expendable guy is the guy that people don't understand what he does because he sat in the corner on facebook and twitter the whole day um you know and 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 so just knew that i would probably naturally be um one of the people on 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 the chopping block mm-hmm. but the thing was is i'd worked at um Looksmart, BT Looksmart, that used to be the search engine for um, Alta Vista and uh, and actually MSN before before being and, and whatnot. Um, and I had witnessed two rounds of layoffs there, and then got laid off myself in two thousand and three mm. when Google just blew everybody out of the water. And so, even in two thousand and three, I'd stopped. And explored the idea of starting my own thing. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know where. My father's in the Navy and was in the Navy for 40 years. My brother's a teacher. My other brother's a former metropolitan policeman. Mm-hmm. So where this entrepreneurial bug came from, I don't know. But, you know, I, I, I was ready and I had a plan. And um, it's just been quite the journey going from uh, September 2012 to where we are today. And speaking of where where are you guys today? I know that you guys have kind of been on a, on a big growth trajectory. Have some big. You guys, you guys are looking to hire like fifteen people this year or more. Yeah, um, and we've already hired seven. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. For those listening, we, we are currently in March, so seven yeah. before March fifteenth, basically. Yeah, um, we uh, at the end of twenty nineteen had a, a a big think about. You know our, our our growth and our potential, and I needed, you know, as a CEO, a bit of focus around business development because you know when you start a small business and people are peppering you with, you know, pitches or or, or ideas or can you do this and can you do that and you know you, you you learn over the years that you need focus. So we decided to focus on B two B technology, marketing, predominantly enterprise startups with money because we wanted to have a big impact. We wanted to have an impact on the world through the technology that we help these businesses sell and market and whatnot. Um, as soon as we did that, you know, it, 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 everything just fell into place and became so much clearer. Mm. Uh, then COVID hit. Um, ironically, Bing Ads, Microsoft Advertising was a client of ours. Okay. Um, and you know, across some of our clients, that, that there was a bit of a budget pullback uh, because no one knew what the hell was going on back in March, April, uh, or, or you know what the future looked like. But everybody else held held steady. Um, we pivoted from helping companies with demand gen for in-person events to virtual, mm. um, and then suddenly saw everything growing since then. Um, because technology has been, you know, such a driver of transformation and connection and resilience for so many companies across the world, we were lucky enough to be in the right bucket at the right time. I've got friends that have worked in retail and travel industries and whatnot, and you know, not fared so well. But um, I've been through, I don't know, three, four recessions um, right. in, in my lifetime, and knew that this was the time. To invest, uh, if we saw some potential when we come out the other end. Yeah, I was going to ask what since COVID. You know, we're now twelve months in, give or take, um, from when it really shut the whole world down. Was there anything you learned in the past twelve months about yourself or about the agency that maybe you wouldn't have learned otherwise? Um, oh, there's tons of stuff that I've learned. Uh, I, I, I have a a kind of mantra of um, hold your nerve uh, because I think it was very easy in the early days to just not know what was going on, um, companies falling by the wayside, people getting you know laid off left, right, and center. It was very easy to have a knee-jerk reaction. My, my wife left Microsoft four years ago to join the business. Okay. Um, it was very easy to have a knee-jerk reaction and just say, look, Let's just forget about all this and and, mm-hmm. and and come back to it later. 
because we don't know what's going to happen. You know, they didn't know that a vaccine was possible back in March, April. But, you know, we decided to invest and reinvest in the company. Um, you know, when we had clients cancelling left, right and centre um, and really focus our time on on those clients that we had to continue to maintain them, grow them. And on the other side, the, the big thing that I learned was, and we learned it quite a bit earlier, and I'm thankful that we went through that exercise, was that having a good company culture is, is hugely important. Back when we were seven people, we went through an exercise of um, – the whole team putting together our vision and our mission and our company principles that, you know, we stand by. They're, they're on our website. They're things like, you know, fearless and forthright and always learning and family first and celebrate uniqueness and things like that. And when COVID hit, everybody goes remote. We, we had a, <laughs> a a brilliant lady, woman called uh, um, Brittany, who we'd just given a role to and she drove from, Salt Lake City to Seattle and then ended up in lockdown in an apartment north of Seattle. Um, she didn't know anybody. And so, you know, her and a whole bunch of our other teams all going remote. Uh, it was very important for us to keep the connection going and, and, and maintain uh, the culture side of things while my wife and I were one, wor worrying about the numbers and, you know, were we going to make budget and how many more clients were going to cancel and, you know, what the world was going to look like in six months. So I think taking a big deep breath, holding your nerves, sleeping on it, not making any big rash decisions, um, you know, in the moment, but also making sure that you're really balancing, you know, the business side of the business with the culture side to ensure that your team is, is, is tip top, feels connected, um, and feels cared about in one of the scariest times, if not the scariest times of our lives. Hmm. What um, we talked a little bit offline before about mindset, about positivity. You know, you've you've made some significant investments in in that in your in your journey in your business as well. Um, talk a little bit about that. Like, what has been? Because I'm a big mindset guy, right? I I believe mindset is is more important than skill set in in most situations, right? Obviously. A uh, brain surgeon probably needs to have a little bit more skill set than than mindset, but I think mindset probably requires him to build the skill set. So, nonetheless, um, for you, you have made some significant investments. One, why? Well, why did you see the need for? We talked about mental health as well a little bit offline. Um, and then, two, what does that journey look like for you as you've developed your mindset? And like you said, holding. I think you said hold your nerve. Right? Was your is your mantra? Like, was that kind of birthed out of this mindset? Because some people would freak out in a situation like this, but then there's some unique individuals who can really stay steady, stay, um, I don't want to say stoic necessarily, but stay consistent in this time. So first one is one, what was that journey like? Um, why'd you invest in it? Those kind of things. Yeah. Um, well, I'm nearly 50 and in the 80s and, and 90s, you know, I, I suffered a lot from anxiety, yeah. stress, um, but nobody knew what it was. I didn't know what it was. I, I, I just knew that I looked at things in a certain way that um, that wasn't helpful. <laughs> wasn't helpful to people around me. It wasn't helpful to myself uh, and, and and whatnot. And um, I. Kind of randomly, because we work with a lot of um, executives, you know, that are very high powered, that, you know, work on huge pieces of business at some of these big tech companies. I, th I found myself in rooms with them where they were asking me questions about stuff that wasn't about marketing and, and mm. whatever. And, you know, that, that used to stress me out because I always wanted to say the right thing and, and all this kind of thing. Um, and so I went off and did a coaching course, uh, professional coaching. Um, and this particular course was with a company called IPEC, the in International Institution of Professional Excellence in Coaching. And they have a thing called the Energy Leadership Program. And, and what that does is, is really describe the different levels of energy that we're in in any given day, any given hour, any given week. And they start off at one 
people feeling like they're the victim the whole time. Mm. Um, you know, number two, fit people f then going from victim to conflict. So finding that they're in the conflict the whole time. And then three, it kind of goes into um, the status quo. So, you know, you're just like, well, whatever. This is just the way the world works. This is my lot. Um, four goes to the caregiver. The caregiver is where you're spending so much time worrying about other people, you're not worrying about yourself. And what you're trying to get to is five, six, and seven. Five is win-win. Mm. That's having the perspective on a situation that is positive that thinks instead of, you know, that client, you know, wanting to pull that budget back and me getting angry and annoyed about that at the start of COVID, I would say, okay, well, if you're pulling that budget back, that means that frees up more time for some yeah. of my people to go and work on a, on a marketing program or write some blog posts to help us get us back out there and all that kind of stuff. So what that taught me, and it was real manna from heaven. I mean, it was, it, it, it just taught me that, that we are in these different levels of energy and it's our perspective mm. around what happens to us and how we choose to react to that particular situation in that particular time. Because for too many people, they'll read something, you know, on face value instead of thinking, okay, how can I turn this to my advantage? And I'm saying this to my team all the time that, yes, there are situations with clients or work and, and, and things like that, that that end up getting stressful. But it's it's good to step back and hold your nerve and think about, you know, is that really true? Is is what's coming up for me really true? Should I be feeling stressful about the situation or could I look at it another way that's going to make me feel better about the situation, mm. which will then, you know, the stress miss will come down and I can see a path forward to get where I need to go. I love that. Yeah, there's um, you know, a mindset tactic or trick, which is more about looking at the situation that is, you know, in some cases it sucks, right? COVID sucks on the surface, right? And, and but I've heard story after story after story of all the things that have come from that, including even your story, right? My story is very similar. Um, in terms of what happened at the very beginning of COVID versus where we're at now, we're actually in a far better place. Uh, we were in a great place before, things fell off the cliff, and then now we're even better than we were. Uh, and I'm grateful for this time. I'm, I'm. It's unfortunate the lives that have been lost and, and all that shit that's happened, you know, uh, outside of my control. But nonetheless, it, it. I'm grateful for the time that it has, has created. And I think that it takes a a certain muscle, right? The brain is a muscle that we have to exercise. Right, like it is something that we have to continually work on. Is there anything that you've done specifically from a from a mindset, from a um, positivity or philosophy perspective that has helped you kind of exercise that muscle? Obviously, you went to coaching, which is a practical thing, but is there something that you did that actually helped you kind of create that that framing or, or the way that you think? Right, that that you can find good in things, and instead of looking at the negative, you know, one thing I talk about with a lot of um, like salespeople who I train a lot of agency owners, I train a lot of salespeople. The mindset is is more than half the battle in my opinion, right? It, it takes a lot. Um, you know, skill set, aptitude, all those things are important, but mindset is just one of those things that uh, your belief in something has an incredible and immense amount of power and it is something that you have to work on like a muscle. Um, is there anything you've specifically done that has helped you work that muscle that has... You know, is there something, a, a practice that you do on a regular basis that has helped you kind of frame the way you think and the way you view, view life and view situations? Um, I, as far as exercising the mind and whatever, you know, I'm always, I'm always learning. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, you know, being self-critical about what I don't know and making sure that I never, ever give off the impression that I know everything. So always learning and, and, and doing training. I've just done two of the Harvard online training courses back to back, which oh, I'm well. sure my, my wife was too pleased with, but one on management essentials and one on leadership principles. And they're absolutely brilliant. You know, and, and that was 10 weeks over the last three months, including in the run up to the holidays, um, six, seven hours a week. Um, you, you, you could look at, you know, the fact that I live on a, 
nice, you know, property on Bainbridge Island and have a company with 27 people. You know, he doesn't need to go and learn any. But mm. I, I always feel that I need to push myself. So that's the mental side of things. But then COVID also just just sitting around thinking and reading actually a lot about you know, that, that there's two there's two paths people took in COVID, you know, heavy drinking and heavy eating or mm. heavy you know exercise and, uh, and and working out and thankfully i went the uh the heavy exercise and working out um and i actually lost 20 25 pounds over the last year invested in a, a peloton bike smashed um, glistening a little bit this morning yeah, you're smashed, you're smashed, sure. the hell out of, smashed the hell out of that um 30 minutes with ben oldis this morning doing a hit in the hill with Brian. um and it was funny, it was snowed here like really big time. It was about I don't know, two, three feet of snow over a couple, and it was really cold and we cozied up and I couldn't be bothered to, um, to, to, to get on the bike and whatever. And I found after two weeks of not doing some pretty heavy blasting aerobic activity that the waking up in the middle of the night worrying about this that and the other started happening again so i've just jumped straight on the bike um so it's two things well well three things one is just continually learning putting myself through courses um the harvard stuff you work with people from all over the world literally every country in the world will have somebody on that course with you that you can learn from wow. to the, the the physical exercise but then also just I don't know whether it's a maturity thing, you know, being an old codger um, coming up to my, in, well, in my 50th year, but being able to hear something or receive an email or be in a conversation with someone and actually step back mm. and think, you know, is that really true? Is that, is that, the way that I should be reacting. Like, how can I see this in a different way? How can I be positive about it? And there's a book that I'm reading right now um, called The Choice. Um, it was recommended by Melinda Gates. Uh, and it's a woman uh, who is a psychotherapist, psychologist. Now, she's still alive, but she went through the Holocaust in, in Auschwitz. Wow. And she was at Auschwitz and survived. And it's all about how she discovered um, this guy called Frankel. I haven't done too much research because I've literally just read the chapter, but th there's a quote from a chap called Frankel about, um, you know, the fact that deep inside us, we have the power to actually choose the way that we react to certain situations. And mm. yeah, I'm sure in this case, you know, she finds peace with what, well, I haven't read the rest of it yet, but I'm sure that the story is going to be that she finds peace in what happened to her in, you know, d d during the, the Holocaust by, by choosing not to let it, you know, control her and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And if you can get uh, there, if you can get there without even having to go through something as horrific as the Holocaust, where there may not even be an end in sight, if you can get there now, when life's probably not that bad in comparison. I don't want to minimize anyone's problems nonetheless. However, if you can get there now where you can be at peace with the the downsides, if you want to call them that, man, you're you can be dangerous. You can be yeah. you can be a force to be reckoned with. If you can go into life confident, knowing that even if the worst shit happens, like I'm gonna walk through this still. I'm gonna be at peace with whatever the bad is, and I'm gonna take the good as it comes, and I'm gonna try to build upon that you know, day by day, step by step. Yeah. That's huge. Man, I love that. Mindset, folks. It uh it is incredibly important. We don't talk enough about it. I think in my we get we so we obsess about silver bullets and technology and, and we obsess about tactics and tricks and we don't talk enough about some of this stuff that I think is incredibly powerful. The mind. Your mind can do a lot more. If you haven't researched it before, you should look up the reticular activating system in your brain. It is a fascinating little bundle of neurons at the top of your brainstem that does some some cool stuff. It's it's the whole premise of the reticular activating system is it's something that you can train, but it basically acts as the bodyguard or the gatekeeper to your conscious mind, right? So we have seventy five thousand thoughts that go through our head a day. 
we're only cognizant of about 10% of them. Well, how does how do we choose what's 10% we're cognizant of? That's the reticular activating system's job. And so it's kind of like when you're shopping for a car and you're like, well, I want to go buy a, a BMW. I believe that I want to go buy a BMW. You probably start seeing BMWs everywhere on the, on the road, right? They've always been there. It's not like everyone just went out and bought a BMW, but your reticular activating system is now calling to mind that which it believes is important to supporting the belief system of your brain. Same thing goes in business is, is your belief system. If you believe negative is going to happen, you're probably going to have the negative attracted to you. A lot of people call this like the law of attraction. I think it's just called biology. Um, so I think it's super important. The mindset, uh, it is a powerful, powerful thing. Um, and I don't want to stop necessarily, but however, I got to pay the bills. I got to make a little bit of money here. Uh, so real quick, this episode is brought to you by me. Me. Um, listen, we're, we're launching an agency sales mastermind. Um, a community of agency owners that uh, believe in growth, that believe in uh, firing themselves from sales, right? At the end of the day, I believe that if you want to become what you want to become in your agency, running your agency, being the CEO of your agency, getting back into the creative work, the technical work, whatever it is that you enjoy doing, you have to remove yourself from the sales component. Now, a lot of folks don't understand how to do that. And so we are creating a community of people who are either in the process of doing that or who are doing that. And so we're creating a mastermind where you're going to be around other like-minded agency owners. So if you want to get your sales right in your agency, I want to invite you to have a conversation with us. And if that is you, if you want more information, I want you to talk to my team. Go to www.salesdrivenagency.com. Top right-hand corner, just click book a call and you will 100% uh, find value in just a 30-minute call with my team. Um, and maybe we'll see in the mastermind. Otherwise, um, let's get back to the episode because it's a phenomenal one with Mel. Um, but I want to give you that opportunity and that invitation to go check out our agency sales mastermind. Now, Mel, bring you back in. So I want to get a little bit more in, in the weeds a little bit as you have talked about uh, where your agency is at today, 27 people. You've obviously got a great setup where you're currently at. You're riding the Peloton in the middle of the day because you could afford the ability to do that. Um, and you guys are crushing it. I want to talk a little bit about how. So I'm a big proponent of growth, right? That's what I love doing. A lot of people get there organically. Some people have to actually go towards it in, in a more strategic or methodical way. How do you guys grow? Where are you guys getting amazing clients from? Um, obviously, you lost a lot of clients in COVID or you had some people pause or cancel and you had to kind of pull yourself up by your bootstraps and figure it out to get to where you're at today. How does Delightful Communications grow? Um, from a client perspective, it's it's just, I mean, strategically, <clears throat> we've we've made sure that we can do pretty much everything. I mean, people call it the full service, but you know, we, we call it integrated. Um, and the reason for that is when we first started, I was, you know, ignorant, didn't really know what I was doing, uh, and, and decided that being strategy, a strategy company would be great. Let's just do all the strategy. Let's take, take a big fat fee and, and then go on to the next one. Mm. But what happened was we worked with Deloitte Digital. We work with Alaska Airlines. We put together these big strategic pieces, and at the end of it, they'd say, "This is amazing. These ideas are fantastic. Influencer marketing, amazing. You know, um, uh, personal branding, executive leadership, all, all that. Great. Okay, can you implement it?" And we'd be like, uh, "No, there's only two of us." Because at the time, there was two of us, and that was the end of the conversation. So that did two things: one, end of the conversation with that client because we can't actually do anything and they only need strategy once or, you know, once every few years right. uh, when it comes to some of this stuff. And two, the ongoing conversation was, you know, we, we couldn't actually do the work, but also none of our ideas got implemented or they got stolen by other agencies that picked them up and did them. So that's when we decided to, to do more. Um, so we do everything from, you know, research to strategy to, you know, putting together the tactics and then the tactical execution of, of, of all that stuff. So certainly doing that. And then the more work you do 
and the more great work that you do, the more people notice and the bigger the budgets get because you're able to demonstrate your impact. You know, and when you're working with companies like Microsoft, you know, and Intel and, and, and big companies like that, you know, there, there is a lot of budget around, but you also need great, great people. So we make sure that we try and balance the great work that we do with great people, make sure that they're super duper tip top trained up um, a, a, across everything to do the work. Um, and that, you know, they're, they're empowered to start helping grow the business. We, we um, started something at the beginning of this year with the whole team around what we call fiscal enthusiasm. Uh, because a lot of people, you know, they come in, they do their job and they do a great job, but they're not trained to think, oh, this client's asked me to do a video. Why, why, why do you want to do a video? Well, I, I, I want one for my website. Okay, well, what's the strategy behind the video? What's the distribution? Mm. You know, where's it going to go? And you can take that one video and turn it into a strategic piece of work and then six videos that will go out on all these different channels and, and off you go. So part of the growth is actually empowering our teams all the way, you know, through the business to think entrepreneurially about how to grow their particular part of the business. The other thing is that previously, and, and this comes to the mindset thing, you know, we've taken on work, we've been given more work, and then we've kind of waited until not quite bursting point, but until everybody's at capacity before we then hire somebody else in, um, you know, to take some of the, um, you know, the steam out of it, you know, and then do that again. Our strategy now has been to hire ahead of time yeah. to then say, okay, everybody's got a good book of business. They've got a good, good set of clients that they're working on. Let's hire the next layer of people to come in to the business so that we can grow those pieces that we've got, but also go out externally to other businesses and talk about what we're doing because we've now got 27 people doing amazing work. We've got great, great case studies. We've got great examples of our work um, and, and doing it that way. And by having that positive mindset that it isn't going to come all, it isn't all going to come crashing down and that we can cope if we lost, you know, this client over here, um, because we would just put the foot down on the business development accelerator mm. and, and just find some more because people are just bashing down the door the whole time. So that's kind of been our, our evolving approach to now. Yeah, I think it's super important too. We, we call it a whip limit internally uh, at our company where it's, it, it's having essentially an understanding of where your team capacity is, right? And, and once we hit a certain threshold, uh, I don't do this, my COO does this, but um, whenever we hit this certain threshold, it's okay, bring someone in because at the end of the day, the last thing you want to do is hire someone out of a deep necessity. And then you're having to spend time and resources on getting them up to speed just to service an account that already needed them. Right. Yeah. Because it slows down one, it slows down their onboarding, but two, a lot more mistakes are going to be made in that first little bit. And so if you can be more proactive in your hires and you, you've afforded yourself that opportunity. And like you said, it does take a mindset, right? A lot of us have this scarcity mindset of, what if it goes away tomorrow and I hire someone today? You know, like that's that's the mindset. I think it's ultimately is like, no, if, if we want to get to where we want to get to, we've got to make those decisions. We've got to, uh, we have um, uh, an a info product called Fire Yourself Academy, which is all about firing yourself from sales. Because um, a lot of agency owners are still stuck selling, being the one who has to close the deals, being the one who has to find the deals and mine their network and things. And and we talk a lot about being able to fire yourself from sales and, and that there's something that has to happen there. One, you have to have the fire yourself mindset, right? Like that you can actually do it and that your business needs it in order for you to get to where you want to get to. Uh, but then two, you have to have a framework for how do you actually go about firing yourself? Um, what, is, what does that even look like doing? And so similar principles there of, of knowing who to hire, when to hire, and actually just making the jump. And, and one practical thing that we've always talked about is no one can fill a seat that you're currently sitting in. Right. At the end of the day, I can't hire someone and expect them to take over my role if I can't get out of the seat and let them sit in it. 
Mm-hmm. They're always sitting beside me waiting for me to get up. They're never going to be in the cockpit in control of that role. And so there's, there's, a, there's a level of investment, not just in salary and in bonuses and in compensation of some sort, but there's also the investment of, of lost opportunity for a season to let them flourish, right? You've got to invest. You know, sales is one of those where you have to be okay with getting out of the sales seat letting someone else sit in it and really screw up opportunities. They're going to screw up deals. Sorry. And so you've got to be able to invest not just direct money into someone, but indirect opportunity costs and things of that nature. But nonetheless, if you want to scale, you want to get there, you've got to be okay with someone doing it 50, 60, 70% as good of you. At the, yeah. the, uh, the, the, the challenge that, uh, and it's a good challenge and it's, you know, something that our senior lead, team will be um you know grateful for in in years to come from from the experience of but it's taken me a long time to let go of some stuff and, mm-hmm. and trust other people to get on with it and just kind of go la 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 <laughs> oh they did it they did it um my challenge now is coaching those teams mm-hmm. to do the same thing with their teams uh, and and then encourage right. the people um, you know that, that they're leading to actually rise to the challenge and say to themselves I could actually be doing what you know that person's doing yeah um, yep. and, and and that's that's the little bit of the conundrum now but um, we're getting there and I, I have a fantastic I, I couldn't wish for a better team than we've got right now. Um, they are simply, simply awesome. And, you know, I talked to them yesterday. When, when we talk to these leaders and executives about, you know, their leadership brand, we give, we give them the legacy question and we show a picture of, you know, a beach in the Bahamas and we say when you're sat on the beach and you're looking back over your career, you know, did you take all the risks? Did you, you know, did you put the time in? Um, uh, you know, did you do the things that you wanted to do? Uh, and, and what is the impact that you want to have? And, and we're, we're doing that with our team right now to yeah. let them know that these are really formative years for the rest of their careers. And it's it's really important to, in, and I to commend invest. That, you know, there's a big difference between leadership and management. You know, leadership yeah. is is what you're talking about. It's really taking ownership of the people on your ship, right? It's 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 one, it's taking ownership of them. But then two, it's being able to get them all on, on on the boat, rowing in the same direction. Now, a manager is the one who walks the deck and makes sure that they're rowing in unison and those types of things. But leadership's a different level. It, you're attacking their self-limiting beliefs, their scarcity mindset, their, um, you know, you sometimes a leader has to believe more for someone than that, per current, that person believes for themselves for a season. And your job is to elevate their thinking about, again, their beliefs. What can they do? Okay, we have a guy on our team who... All the, you talked to him, you've talked to him already before this call. Um, all the the tools, like natural ability, um, he's incredible. But, but the one thing that has always hung him up until, you know, recent times is, is, is the mindset and the belief in himself and what he actually wanted. He never gave himself the space to, like you said, sit on the, think about sitting on the beach and reflecting on his career and what risk did you not take? What risk did you take? You know, I think a lot of us would say that, there's a really, I can't remember if it's an article or if it's a, a book, um, but it talks about uh, basically this individual went and interviewed, I think, 100 people at a, at a hospice care um, and basically said, like, what, what were your regrets in life? And everyone always focused on the regrets. They didn't focus on, on uh, the, the risks they took. The, they focused on the things they didn't do. Um, yeah. And I think that's a huge okay. principle. I had um, I, I talked about the leadership branding stuff we did. We basically help executives, um, you know, with their social media, you know, online and, and and stuff. But just have that personal element. I was talking to a guy who's fifty five years old, healthcare CEO, was talking about these concepts, and I, I'll never forget. I said, "What do you think?" And he said, "I want to punch you right now." <laughs> Why? Sorry, <laughs> because if I thought about my career in, in, in this way 30 years ago would have been completely different because he felt he ought to be a CEO. Somebody told him to do that. Yes. Um, and, and that's the path that he went instead of 
looking back and reverse engineering, okay, what, what is the impact on, on, on the world? And, you know, I, I'm still struggling with the detail of the impact. I kind of know that I am just through the fact that I've created a company, created jobs, and the work that we're doing is having a huge impact through technology yes. on the world, whether it's climate change, COVID vaccine distribution, you know, the whole thing. Um, but what you said about regrets and actually minimizing them, um, I mean, there's a song. Is it Robbie Williams, No Regrets or something? Is that somebody had a uh, – or, or was it – Frank Sinatra, I don't know. But, I would but love looking back, for me. I, I want to have so, so many positive things to talk about. I know I will. I'll just be like, you know, we did it. You know, I'll be sitting there with my wife, Ashley, with a pina colada, and we'll be looking back saying, you know, we did it. But we invested the time and we worked damn hard yeah. and yeah. took some risks and made some smart decisions. Um, and some good decisions, and, but we did it in a way that wasn't at, at the expense of anybody else. Mm. Um, that's what we're very, very careful to do. It's not like women and children first after me, you know, yep. pulling up the ladder behind us or anything like that. Life's too short for that, and, and I don't have that regret when I'm looking back. Yeah, I don't remember who said it, but they talked about it might have been one of those gurus like Gary Vaynerchuk or something, but he said something. I, this this is one thing that he did say that resonated with me. Um, <laughs> I thought we were going to get through a conversation without mentioning Gary V. But anyway, go on. <laughs> That's right. Well, one thing he talked about was he said, I, I want to build the biggest building, but I don't want to do it by tearing everyone else's building down. There we go. Yeah. All right. I love yeah, it. That one. yeah, we'll keep that one around. So. Uh, awesome, Mel. Man, I want to jump in and, and wrap this up here. We're coming up on our time. I want to jump in and do the round of random. Six questions. Very easy. Quick. Uh, I didn't tell you any of the questions before on purpose because I just want to hear what the first thing is. And uh, we'll jump in. Some are business. Some are personal. We ask the same questions to every guest. So if you did listen to podcasts before, then you would, you would know the questions. But I want to start off. So Mel, are you ready for the round of random? I'm ready. Ready as you'll <laughs> ever be? All right, this, this first will be more uh, applicable to you specifically because of the space you operate in. But what is your favorite piece of technology or software or tool, uh, whether it be business or personal? Right now, it has to be that Peloton app. Yeah, it's so damn cool. I just think it's incredible. I got do you the have bike. just the bike or do you have both the bike and the treadmill? No, I haven't got the treadmill. I hacked the bike, you know, and used a $300 bike yep. um, and, and use the app and whatever and got quite a lot of kudos on, on a post I posted it on Facebook for it. But then when the Bike Plus came out and you could just twizzle the screen and do weights, just twizzling that screen. That's all it took. It was a seller huh. for me. So I got it and it, it's incredible. It's incredible. That was in. I love it. Uh, number two, if you could have dinner with anyone ever, so living or dead, who would you have dinner with and why? Why don't I tell you? I, I like to it, have people just on the spot. It it would have to be Phil Collins. Mm. Um, I'm being such a nerd. I, I used to. I have a background in musical theatre. I was an actor. Uh, I sung in a band, and I was a huge, huge fan of Phil Collins and um, and Genesis. And uh, I've heard things about him and I've read his book and, you know, I'm kind of on the fence. I think his music is brilliant, you know, his drumming, all that kind of stuff. But I'd really like to drill into some of the choices that he made throughout his life. And um, he, he's made a huge, huge impression on me. So it would probably be. I don't know much about him other than obviously the ever so famous drum solo. Do, 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 do. <laughs> I love it. Uh, third one, very easy question. Are you a? F I think I have. A, I think I have an understanding of probably how you'll answer this question. But are you a physical book reader or are you an audiobook listener? Physical book reader. I knew it. You just seem like a guy who would relish in the paper, the papyrus. Love it. Well, I have to focus. I can't. You can't do two I'll things at one time. I listen to a podcast in the car, but I live on an island. Everything's five minutes away. That's true. Here on <laughs> So, you know, I can't. It's physical, but and physical. sometimes on the Kindle. Kind on the Kindle as well. There you go. That's my wife's yeah. choice. Uh, number four, if you could start any other business other than the agency that you currently run, do you have any idea of what you would start? 
Uh, my wife has bought and renovated one to – we're on to our third house. We're nice. actually building a house now. Love it. Um, we, we love, you know, that sort of stuff. So it, it would be something around – property and, and, and lifestyle and creating uh, spaces and experiences um, I like for it. people to, um, you know, especially now the challenge is, you know, home and work, if we're going to be working from home so often, you know, how do you create a space that can be hybrid? So I think it'd be something like that. I love it. Yeah, I've, I, uh, I invest in real estate as well. And one of my favorite categories is short-term rentals, so Airbnbs. And uh, we always try to have some sort of unique element that creates an experience when people come in. Because um, everybody's got a house that they can put on Airbnb, but if you can create a unique experience, a renovated barn or you know, create a, a karaoke stage in the middle of some house, right? Things that people wouldn't think about just to create an experience. It's a lot of fun. So I love that. That's yeah. very cool. Uh, number five, most of us have that one or two things that we are irrationally passionate about. So some people it's Star Wars, some people it's maybe Phil Collins, some people who knows. Um, do you have anything other than Peloton and other than running an agency that you are irrationally passionate about outside of work? The the Apple TV show Ted Lasso. Ah. Jason Lucas, he won Best Comedy Actor at the Golden Globes. Um, Ted Lasso is probably... It's probably the best TV show that there's. I'm gonna have to watch it. You mentioned it in the green room, so I'm sold. It, it, it is remarkable, and and they they're now feeling. Uh, so it's the new Ships Creek. It's better than Ships Creek, is it? And there's also another show as well on on BritBox. Uh, you can get it on Amazon called Mum M U M, which is a British sitcom. Very good, feel good um, sitcom as well. Uh, but Ted Lasso, hands down. I'm I'll check it out. I've got I've got my out of office today because it's St Patrick's Day and I'm running around doing some errands and I, I have quotes at the bottom. Ted Lasso quotes at the bottom of my. Uh, <laughs> Do you really? Dang, you're committed. <laughs> yeah, I love it. All right, last question, Mel. Uh, where are people going to find you online? How can people find out more about what you're doing? even some of the executive thought leadership type of stuff that we've spoken about a little bit. How can people find out more about you, about Delightful Communications? Um, well, I've worked in SEO for a long time. So if you Google or Bing Mel Carson, you'll find uh, my website, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, all that kind of stuff. Um, it. The website's delightfulcommunications.com. So it's all there. Happy to hear from people. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity of having this great conversation. It's been uh, a lot of fun. I've shared a few things that I've not shared before. That's the goal. Yeah. That's the goal is so, we want to be different than all the other agency folks out there talking just about agencies. So, Mel, it has been an honor. Uh, grateful, humbled you've been on. Thank you so much for your time. I'm sure everyone is going to find a ton of value in this. I appreciate you. Thanks so much. Amen. Right, Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Cheers. All right, stop recording.